Chapter 103 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 103 Maximilien. Villefort rose, half ashamed of being surprised in such a paroxysm of grief. The terrible office he had held for twenty five years had succeeded in making him more or less than man. His glance, at first wandering, fixed itself upon Morel. "'Who are you, sir?' he asked. "'That forget that this is not the manner to enter a house stricken with death. Go, sir, go!' But Morel remained motionless. He could not detach his eyes from that disordered bed and the pale corpse of the young girl who was lying on it. "'Go! Do you hear?' said Villefort, while Davrigny advanced to lead Morel out. Maximilien stared for a moment at the corpse, gazed all round the room, then upon the two men. He opened his mouth to speak, but finding it impossible to give utterance to the innumerable ideas that occupied his brain, he went out, thrusting his hands through his hair, in such a manner that Villefort and Davrigny, for a moment diverted from the engrossing topic, exchanged glances which seemed to say, "'He is mad!' But in less than five minutes the staircase groaned beneath an extraordinary weight. Morel was seen carrying, with superhuman strength, the armchair containing Noirtier upstairs. When he reached the landing, he placed the armchair on the floor and rapidly rolled it into Valentine's room. This could only have been accomplished by means of unnatural strength supplied by powerful excitement. But the most fearful spectacle was Noirtier being pushed towards the bed, his face expressing all his meaning, and his eyes supplying the want of every other faculty. That pale face and flaming glance appeared to Villefort like a frightful apparition. Each time he had been brought into contact with his father, something terrible had happened. "'See what they have done!' cried Morel, with one hand leaning on the back of the chair, and the other extended towards Valentine. See, si, my father, see. Si. Villefort drew back and looked with astonishment on the young man, who, almost a stranger to him, called Noirtier his father. At this moment, the whole soul of the old man seemed centred in his eyes, which became bloodshot. The veins of the throat swelled, his cheeks and temples became purple, as though he was struck with epilepsy. Nothing was wanting to complete this but the utterance of a cry and the cry issued from his pores, if we may thus speak, a cry frightful in its silence. D'Avrigny rushed towards the old man and made him inhale a powerful restorative. "'Sir,' cried Morel, seizing the moist hand of the paralytic, "'they ask me who I am, and what right I have to be here. Oh, you know it! Tell them! Tell them!' And the young man's voice was choked by sobs. As for the old man, his chest heaved with his panting respiration. One could have thought that he was undergoing the agonies preceding death. At length, happier than the young man, who sobbed without weeping, tears glistened in the eyes of Noirtier. "'Tell them,' said Morel in a hoarse voice, "'tell them that I am her betrothed. Tell them she was my beloved, my noble girl.' my only blessing in the world tell them oh tell them that corpse belongs to me the young man overwhelmed by the weight of his anguish fell heavily on his knees before the bed which his fingers grasped with convulsive energy d'avrigny unable to bear the sight of this touching emotion turned away and villefort without seeking any further explanation and attracted towards him by the irresistible magnetism which draws us towards those who have loved the people for whom we mourn, extended his hand towards the young man. But Morel saw nothing. He had grasped the hand of Valentine, and, unable to weep, vented his agony in groans as he bit the sheets. For some time nothing was heard in that chamber but sobs, exclamations, and prayers. At length, Villefort, the most composed of all, spoke. "'Sir,' said he to Maximilien, "'you say you loved Valentine, that you were betrothed to her. 
I knew nothing of this engagement, of this love. Yet I, her father, forgive you. For I see that your grief is real and deep, and besides my own sorrow it is too great for anger to find a place in my heart. But you see that the angel whom you hoped for has left this earth. She has nothing more to do with the adoration of men. Take a last farewell, sir, of her sad remains. Take the hand you expected to possess once more within your own, and then separate yourself from her forever. Valentine now requires only the ministrations of the priest. "'You are mistaken, sir,' exclaimed Morel, raising himself on one knee, his heart pierced by a more acute pang than any he had yet felt. "'You are mistaken. Valentine, dying as she has, not only requires a priest, but an avenger. You, Monsieur de Villefort, send for the priest. I will be the avenger.' "'What do you mean, sir?' asked Villefort, trembling at the new idea inspired by the delirium of Morel. "'I tell you, sir, that two persons exist in you. The father has mourned sufficiently. Now let the procureur fulfil his office.' The eyes of Noirtier glistened, and Avrigny approached. "'Gentlemen,' said Morel, reading all that passed through the minds of the witnesses to the scene, I know what I am saying, and you know as well as I do what I am about to say. Valentine has been assassinated. Villefort hung his head. D'Avrigny approached nearer, and Noirtier said yes with his eyes. Now, sir, continued Morel, in these days no one can disappear by violent means without some inquiries being made as to the cause of her disappearance. Even were she not a young, beautiful and adorable creature like Valentine, Monsieur Procureur, said Morel with increasing vehemence, no mercy is allowed. I denounce the crime. It is your place to seek the assassin. The young man's implacable eyes interrogated Villefort, who on his side glanced from Noirtier to Darigny, but instead of finding sympathy in the eyes of the doctor and his father, he only saw an expression as inflexible as that of Maximilian. Yes, indicated the old man. Assuredly, said D'Avrigny. Sir, said Villefort, striving to struggle against this triple force and his own emotion. Sir, you are deceived. No one commits crimes here. I am stricken by fate. It is horrible indeed, but no one assassinates. The eyes of Noirtier lighted up with rage, and D'Avrigny prepared to speak. Morel, however, extended his arm and commanded silence. "'And I say that murders are committed here,' said Morel, whose voice, though lower in tone, lost none of its terrible distinctness. "'I tell you that this is the fourth victim within the last four months. I tell you, Valentine's life was attempted by poison four days ago, though she escaped, owing to the precautions of Monsieur Noirtier. I tell you that the dose has been double, the poison changed, and that this time it has succeeded. I tell you that you know these things as well as I do, since this gentleman has forewarned you, both as doctor and as a friend. "'Oh, you rave, sir!' exclaimed Villefort, in vain endeavouring to escape the net in which he was taken." "'I rave?' said Morel. "'Well, then, I appeal to Monsieur d'Avrigny himself. "'Ask him, sir, if he recollects the words he uttered in the garden of this house "'on the night of Madame de saint Méran's death. "'You thought yourselves alone, and talked about that tragical death. "'And the fatality you mentioned, then, is the same which has caused the murder of Valentine.' "'Villefort and d'Avrigny exchanged looks. "'Yes?' Yes, continued Morel, recall the scene, for the words you thought were only given to silence and solitude fell into my ears. Certainly, after witnessing the culpable indolence manifested by Monsieur de Villefort towards his own relations, I ought to have denounced him to the authorities. Then I should not have been an accomplice to thy death, as I now am. Sweet, beloved Valentine, but the accomplice shall become the avenger. This fourth murder 
is apparent to all and if thy father abandon thee valentine it is i and i swear it that shall pursue the assassin and this time as though nature had at least taken compassion on the vigorous frame nearly bursting with its own strength the words of morel were stifled in his throat his breast heaved the tears so long rebellious gushed from his eyes and he threw himself weeping on his knees by the side of the bed then d'avrigny spoke and i too he exclaimed in a low voice i unite with monsieur morel in demanding justice for crime my blood boils at the idea of having encouraged a murderer by my cowardly concession oh merciful heavens murmured villefort morel raised his head and reading the eyes of the old man which gleamed with unnatural luster stay he said monsieur noirtier wishes to speak yes indicated noirtier with an expression the more terrible from all his faculties being centered in his glance do you know the assassin asked morel yes replied noirtier and will you direct us exclaimed the young man listen monsieur d'avrigny listen noirtier looked upon morel with one of those melancholy smiles which had so often made valentine happy and thus fixed his attention then having riveted the eyes of his interlocutor on his own he glanced towards the door do you wish me to leave said morel sadly yes replied noirtier alas alas sir have pity on me the old man's eyes remained fixed on the door may i at least return asked morel yes must i leave alone no whom am i to take with me the procureur no the doctor yes you wish to remain alone with monsieur de villefort yes but can he understand you yes oh said villefort inexpressibly delighted to think that the inquiries were to be made by him alone oh be satisfied i can understand my father d'avrigny took the young man's arm and led him out of the room a more than death-like silence then reigned in the house at the end of a quarter of an hour a faltering footstep was heard and villefort appeared at the door of the apartment where d'avrigny and morel had been staying one absorbed in meditation the other in grief you can come he said and led them back to noirtier morel looked attentively on villefort his face was livid large drops rolled down his face and in his fingers he held the fragments of a quill pen which he had torn to atoms gentlemen he said in a hoarse voice give me your word of honor that this horrible secret shall forever remain buried amongst ourselves the two men drew back i entreat you continued villefort but said morel the culprit the murderer the assassin do not alarm yourself sir justice will be done said villefort my father has revealed the culprit's name my father thirsts for revenge as much as you do yet even he conjures you as i do to keep this secret do you not father yes resolutely replied noirtier morel suffered an exclamation of horror and surprise to escape him oh sir said villefort arresting maximilien by the arm if my father the inflexible man makes this request it is because he knows be assured that valentine will be terribly revenged is it not so father the old man made a sign in the affirmative villefort continued he knows me and i have pledged my word to him rest assured gentlemen that within three days in a less time than justice would demand the revenge i shall have taken for the murder of my child will be such as to make the boldest heart tremble and as he spoke these words he ground his teeth and grasped the old man's senseless hand will this promise be fulfilled monsieur noirtier 
asked Morel, while Davrigny looked inquiringly. Yes, replied Noirtier, with an expression of sinister joy. Swear, then, said Villefort, joining the hands of Morel and Davrigny. Swear that you will spare the honour of my house, and leave me to avenge my child. Davrigny turned round and uttered a very feeble, Yes. But Morel, disengaging his hand, rushed to the bed, and after having pressed the cold lips of Valentine with his own, hurriedly left, uttering a long, deep groan of despair and anguish. We have before stated that all the servants had fled. Monsieur de Villefort was therefore obliged to request Monsieur d'Avrigny to superintend all the arrangements consequent upon a death in a large city, more especially a death under such suspicious circumstances. It was something terrible to witness the silent agony, the mute despair of Noirtier, whose tears silently rolled down his cheeks. Villefort retired to his study, and d'Avrigny left to summon the doctor of the mayoralty, whose office it is to examine bodies after decease, and who is expressly named the doctor of the dead. Monsieur Noirtier could not be persuaded to quit his grandchild. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Monsieur d'Avrigny returned with his associate. They found the outer gate closed, and not a servant remaining in the house. Villefort himself was obliged to open to them, but he stopped on the landing. He had not the courage to again visit the death chamber. The two doctors, therefore, entered the room alone. Noirtier was near the bed, pale, motionless, and silent as the corpse. The district doctor approached with the indifference of a man accustomed to spend half his time amongst the dead. He then lifted the sheet which was placed over the face, and just unclosed the lips. Alas, said d'Avrigny, she is indeed dead, poor child. Yes, answered the doctor laconically, dropping the sheet he had raised. Noirtier uttered a kind of hoarse, rattling sound. The old man's eyes sparkled, and the good doctor understood that he wished to behold his child. He therefore approached the bed, and while his companion was dipping the fingers with which he had touched the lips of the corpse in chloride of lime, he uncovered the calm and pale face, which looked like that of a sleeping angel. A tear, which appeared in the old man's eye, expressed his thanks to the doctor. The doctor of the dead then laid his permit on the corner of the table, and, having fulfilled his duty, was conducted out by d'Avrigny. Villefort met them at the door of his study. Having, in a few words, thanked the district doctor, he turned to d'Avrigny and said, "'And now the priest.' "'Is there any particular priest you wish to pray with Valentine?' asked d'Avrigny. "'No,' said Villefort. "'Fetch the nearest.' "'The nearest,' said the district doctor, "'is a good Italian abbé, who lives next door to you. "'Shall I call on him as I pass?' D'Avrigny, said Villefort, be so kind, I beseech you as to accompany this gentleman. Here is the key of the door, so that you can go in and out as you please. You will bring the priest with you, and will oblige me by introducing him into my child's room. Do you wish to see him? I only wish to be alone. You will excuse me, will you not? A priest can understand a father's grief. And Monsieur de Villefort, giving the key to d'Avrigny, again bade farewell to the strange doctor, and retired to his study, where he began to work. For some temperaments, work is a remedy for all afflictions. As the doctors entered the street, they saw a man in a cassock standing on the threshold of the next door. "'This is the abbé of whom I spoke,' said the doctor to d'Avrigny. D'Avrigny accosted the priest. "'Sir,' he said, are you disposed to confer a great obligation to an unhappy father who has just lost his daughter? I mean Monsieur de Villefort, the king's attorney. Ah, said the priest in a marked Italian accent, yes, I have heard that death is in that house. Then I need not tell you what kind of service he requires of you. I was about to offer myself, sir, said the priest. It is our mission to forestall our duties. 
"'It is a young girl.' "'I know it, sir. The servants who fled from the house informed me. I also know that her name is Valentine, and I have already prayed for her.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Davrigny. "'Since you have commenced your sacred office, deign to continue it. Come and watch by the dead, and all the wretched family will be grateful to you.' I am going, sir, and I do not hesitate to say that no prayers will be more fervent than mine. D'Avrigny took the priest's hand, and without meeting Villefort, who was engaged in his study, they reached Valentine's room, which on the following night was to be occupied by the undertakers. On entering the room, Noirtier's eyes met those of the abbé, and no doubt he read some particular expression in them for he remained in the room. D'Avrigny recommended the attention of the priest to the living as well as to the dead, and the abbé promised to devote his prayers to Valentine and his attentions to Noirtier, in order, doubtless, that he might not be disturbed while fulfilling his sacred mission. The priest rose as soon as D'Avrigny departed, and not only bolted the door through which the doctor had just left, but also that leading to Madame de Villefort's room. End of chapter 103